Section 2 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction to A Brief History of the Border. Before dealing in detail with the stirring stories of border history and legend, to retell which is the purpose of this book, we will first inquire what is it that settles exactly the position of the border line between two countries. To find the answer, we must think what happens when a country is invaded. If the invaders are stronger than the people whom they attack, they go on thrusting back their foes till these reach some strong position where, by the aid of mountain, river or marsh, they are able, at any rate for a time, to hold their own. Thus, a borderline is always determined by some natural feature of the country, which gives the defenders an advantage. The attackers will not always operate from the same locality, and the defenders will not always fall back in the same direction. The two sides also will vary in power from time to time. For these reasons, a borderline, especially in the old fighting days, was often altered. When the Romans invaded Britain, they gradually conquered the southern part of it, but they could not subdue the wilder north. One of their boundary lines was drawn from the Solway to the Tyne. Then they fought their way further north, and their next definite boundary was a line running from the Forth to the Clyde. Along each of these boundaries they built a great wall, and to this day parts of these Roman walls remain. But it is worth noting that neither of these wall border lines stands upon the present border, one being all in England and the other all in Scotland. When the Romans left Britain, called back to defend their own native land from invasion, there followed a brief period for which we have no definite record of events in this island. This is the period of King Arthur, and none can say how much is true in the Arthurian legends. But history begins to become clear again about the time that the Angles came in their ships across the North Sea, bent on conquest. They landed on all the natural harbours of the east coast, driving the Britons back and taking the land for themselves. The fact that they landed on the east and drove the Britons westward leads us to think that sooner or later a boundary would have been formed dividing the island into the east side for the Angles and the west side for the Britons. Now that is exactly what did happen. The border lines were nowhere like the present ones. The northern kingdom of the Angles reached to the fourth, where these people founded Edinburgh, Edwinsburg. On the west, the Britons had sway in Cornwall, Cornwallis, Wales, Cumbria, which stretched from the Mersey to the Solway, and Strathclyde, from the Solway to the Clyde. North of the Forth was the country of the Picts, while the Scots were a race recently come from Ireland, and they only owned what we now call Argyleshire, and the islands lying near to it. Not one inch of the present border was at that day in the border line. Of the various races that lay round about where the border now is, the Northumbrians seemed at first to be the strongest. The capital of their kingdom was Bamborough, a place still famous for its castle, though today it is not important enough to have a railway station. But it still looks very picturesque on the wild coast with the Farne Islands, the first seat of Northumbrian Christianity, in the near distance. 
ambition had much to do with the downfall of Northumbria. The famous King Edbert would not rest content till he had scaled Dumbarton, the capital of Strathclyde. This was to his career what the march to Moscow was to Napoleon's, for though Edbert got safely to Dumbarton, 756, his army was cut to pieces in getting back again. The Northumbrians seem to have lost some of their northern lands, for they moved their capital further south to the old Roman city of Corbridge, which stood on the Tyne, just where the delightful country town of that name stands today. In 844, a king of the Scots named Kenneth MacAlpin became, we don't quite know how, king of the Picts also, joining two strong races under one ruler, and thus was powerful enough to give great trouble to the weakened kingdom of Northumbria. He several times led his army through Lothian, the district belonging to the Angles between the Forth and the Tweed, but was never quite able to conquer it. It is important to remember that up to that date Lothian had never belonged to Scotland. The appearance of the Danes added to the confusion of those restless days. For some few years it was doubtful whether Scot, Dane or Angle would get the best of it in Northumbria. But at last, the genius of Athelstan of Wessex revived the power of the Angles over the whole of that large part of the island which they had settled, right up to the Forth itself. Edinburgh was still English in 957, and the borderline was still very far from the present one. But there was no longer a king of Northumbria, only an earl, who was subject to the will of the West Saxon kings. This fact of the dominance of the West Saxons, whose capital was far to the south at Winchester, must have added to the weakness of the Northumbrian border. By the year 963, the Scots had conquered Edinburgh, and it was now never again to return to English rule. Before very long, the whole of Lothian had passed under Scottish control, but it was not yet held to be part of Scotland. Nor must it be thought that this conquest of Lothian fixed the borderline in its present position, for the King of the Scots was at that time ruler over Cumberland, which had never yet been English, and was all that was left of the old British kingdom of Cumbria. Frontier wars with varying successes between Scot, Angle and Dane mark the stormy history of this time. The power of Canute held back the Scotch attempts upon Northumberland, but during a lull in the wars, the grandson of the Scottish king married the sister of Earl Siward, and received as her dowry twelve towns in the valley of the Tyne, an astonishingly imprudent arrangement. At the time of the Battle of Hastings, the earldom of Northumberland was so far distant from Winchester as to be somewhat out of the control of the King of England. The power of the Scottish kings threatened it. They held twelve towns in Tynedale, and Cumberland was a part of Scotland. The Northumbrians refused to accept William the Conqueror as their king, and had they been able to make good their refusal, they must sooner or later have been conquered by the Scots, and the borderline between England and Scotland would then most probably have been formed by the Tees, the mountain boundary of Westmoreland and Morecambe Bay. But William was not a king to be played with. He reduced Northumberland to subjection and carried his army into Scotland as far as the River Tay, where he forced the King of Scotland to admit that he, William, was his overlord. Notwithstanding this humiliation, when King William returned to Winchester, the Scots several times went back to their favourite amusement of raiding unhappy Northumberland. 
One of these invasions took place in the reign of William Rufus, 1093, who went north in person. He doubtless recognised the fact that owing to the Scots possessing Cumberland, they were in the strong position of being able to attack Northumberland on two sides. He took Cumberland by force of arms, and thus for the first time it became a part of England. The word Cumberland means the land of the Cumbrians or Welsh, a Saxon form of the Welsh word Cymru. Rufus rebuilt the strong fortress of Carlisle to defend his new border at its weakest corner. For the most part, this border is excellently protected by the natural rampart of the wild Cheviot Hills, and is in every way as good a border as could be devised. It runs in a fairly straight line from southwest to northeast across a narrow part of the island. But although this border line proved to be a permanent one, it must not be thought that it remained undisputed. The times were rough, and hardy fighting folk lived on the border. They had many grounds for quarrel, and took advantage of them all. For one thing, the exact boundary of Northumberland was never quite defined till 1552, up to which year there was a tract of land between the rivers Esk and Sark, which was claimed by both countries, and therefore called the Debatable Land. Then the Scots maintained that they were overlords of Northumberland, while the English kings cherished the notion that they were overlords of the whole island of Britain, and the wild spirits on both sides were always ready to fight. Out of this fighting spirit sprung the stirring history of the border, which forms the theme of the deathless ballads, the stories of which it is now our purpose to retell. End of section two.